everyone, uh, my name is Suyash, Suyash Joshi as you can see. I work at Oracle and I work as a cloud developer advocate. And I'm, I'm delighted to be here. I'm originally from India but I live in San Francisco now and I work in our headquarters there. And I support uh, our teams working on machine learning and AI and also on OCI or our cloud infrastructure services. Today I want to talk about Java and in the context of machine learning and deep learning. I'm curious how many people are here are students? How many are students? Okay, a few. How many people are working like less than five years of experience maybe? Okay, great majority. How many people are more than uh, 10 years of experience working? Awesome, awesome. How many people more than 30 years of experience? You can still be learning. <laughs> okay, no one. Uh, learning never stops. I um, think the volume is okay, it's not too loud, perfect. So we'll start, dive right in. The legal slide I have to show you, uh, but I'm sure you're tired of seeing this today. So we'll go past it. Why Java and why machine learning? You might be thinking, you know, a lot of people, uh, how many people are Java developers or Java fans? Great. So this, the, I don't need to give you any answer. The answer is you love Java, you know. If you are really passionate about Java, you're happy. But a lot of people, when I tell them, they're like, mm, I don't like, you know, Java is kind of intimidating, scary. I like Python, and the whole machine learning community is kind of going, you know, in the Python world. And, or, uh, but, you know, that's not necessarily the case. It's kind of like, uh, it's the trend. It's like in fashion right now, but Java has its place. And uh, there are a lot of libraries that I'm going to showcase today. But the three, I call the three P's, why Java should play a bigger role in machine learning. One, we have a big talent pool. Like I saw, all you guys are very excited about Java. Performance is the another, another aspect of Java, especially in the enterprise world. Most of the big companies run either on Java or .NET technologies. And there is a good reason behind. Why? Because they want to... They want high performance computing. And of course, if we're talking about AI, a lot of big data technologies are written on top of Java, Java stack, you can say. And of course, the last P is projects. Open source community, open source projects. How many people attended the Graal VM session today or the keynote? Okay, great. So as you know, uh, we're putting a lot of open source stuff out there and especially also open JDK now, which is, on par with the Oracle JDK. And uh, there are a lot of deep learning frameworks. So there is no reason why you shouldn't be using Java if you weren't for you doing machine learning. And uh, I created a matrix here and I then put the other languages. There are a bunch of those libraries already. Uh, but I also like JavaScript and I used to be a web developer before. Um, so I played with JavaScript machine learning and you can do that. but. In Java ecosystem, there are all of these open source frameworks and toolkits and libraries out there. This talk, I'm going to focus on Deep Learning for J and uh, Veka and a little bit TensorFlow. TensorFlow, I put a star because TensorFlow actually is written in C++ because it, you need to do high performance computing uh, at a native layer. So it's written in C++. It has bindings in Java and other language, oh, sorry, in Python and Java as well. But uh, Java ones are like maintained as much as the Python ones. So Python gets more, you know, everybody thinks TensorFlow equals Python, but that's not the case. Uh, TensorFlow has uh, implementation in other languages, including uh, Swift. So here's a big picture. Why well, I'm excited these days about this topic, and I'm sorry if you cannot read these text down here. Uh, I'll. The main picture here is this image is like expansion of the universe. It's showing the big trend, what's happening. So AI right now, you know, is the buzzword and the hyper is around machine learning toolkits. So machine learning toolkits and then the next trend that's happening, especially the enterprise ecosystem is data science platforms where you can do machine learning on big data and not just, you know, for scientific or research purpose, but in the enterprise. And we, all, we are working on that at Oracle, some of you may have heard of it. And then what's gonna come later on or what I'm already seeing is happening. These things are already kind of happening in you know, small sectors, but the big trend is AI will become kind of like a commodity. Cognitive services, 
so for example, machine learning right now, you need to have a bunch of PhDs and uh, spend a lot of money, uh, do a lot of training basically, very expensive computing. In future, a lot of that stuff would be defined to very small s subset of people and uh, you can grab any kind of model or any really uh, like a solution, AI solution. Think of like, like an app store, like iTunes. You can just grab the model that you need to do uh, for cancer detection, for let's say you're in a pharmaceutical company, you're making a drug and you wanna get few models and you wanna run your machine learning. So you don't have to, right now these models are very narrow and they have limitations. So you know, there's a lot of research happening, but as time will go by, uh, it'll become a commodity. So it's, uh, and when, it, when that happens, there's gonna be other, other areas that'll open up where the application side will become more important. What you can do with this, what kind of business application can you build, what problem can you solve? So the three big drivers of all of this machine learning AI is big data, cloud computing, and neural networks. And uh, this is you know, the Oracle plug. So at our company, would working on all three technologies. So some of you may have attended the session on autonomous database here and learn about the machine, machine learning to, uh, support it has for using SQL. And uh, so if you are doing anything with big data, you can use Oracle's technology, especially the autonomous database. If you're doing anything cloud computing, we have OCI. And uh, for training these models, you can train them on these NVIDIA, very expensive GPUs that you don't have to you know, pay six, seven figures in dollars, but you can just pay as you go uh, model on the cloud, or and you can use high performing computing infrastructure. And Oracle, a lot of people don't know, is also we have a lot of research labs all over the world, and people are publishing papers all the time. Uh, their job is basically to invent or come up with new models or new ways, new algorithms in the field of machine learning. Because we use that in a lot of our products internally, aside from building a platform to build machine learning or data science technologies. But a lot of Oracle technologies use machine learning themselves. Uh, so this is kind of like a, you know, a big picture, because machine learning is a big term, umbrella term, and inside of that is deep learning. And there are various kinds of these learning. So there is supervised learning. Three basic categories are supervised, unsupervised, and reinforcement learning. Supervised learning, or even unsupervised learning, kind of falls into two kind of domains. We can say regression problems or classification problems. Now, the ed at the edges, uh, I don't know. From here, I cannot read them clearly, but maybe from the back you can. But it's showing various use cases. So. For image, for fraud detection, let's say spam, you would have something uh, of a classification problem where you would classify an email as spam or not spam. Or if you were doing a population growth prediction, if you uh, are a scientist, a political scientist or economist, and you want to, you know, you're building smart cities in India and you want to determine what are the resources needed, you would use something like a regression algorithm to predict what the population will grow, how much infrastructure will be needed, all of those things. And uh, there is other algorithms, uh, they come in the umbrella of clustering, so something like, uh, let's just say, if you shop on your favorite e-commerce website and it, and it shows you, you may also wanna buy this and that. And, and how does it know that? It, it uses a mix of technologies, I think. A lot of it is clustering, is clustering people who have bought similar products and they're grouping, they also bought this and it's showing you. And there's reinforcement learning, which is more applied in games right now because it's uh, time bound and where the algorithm is learning from the environment. It's really, really uh, popular and really powerful, but uh, my focus will be on, mostly on supervised learning. So I'm just gonna quickly explain the high level deep learning workflow. So like we said earlier, you start with big data, right? You need a lot of data, and what you end up creating is something like this, a model. A model is nothing but a graph, and a graph is also a network, you know, as a data structure, and uh, what we are doing is we're training this graph. So to train it, that's the first step, we need to provide it data. So in the, let's say if you were to 
do a classical, you know, if you were, if you were just going to write something, you would not give it an answer, right? You would write a logical statement like algorithm and then the algorithm will uh, give you the answer. In machine learning, you provided the answer, you provided the training data set and you don't, you don't hack in the solution. You let the, basically you train it and you let the model figure out what the solution is. I'm just talking very high level right now, I'll dive deeper into these things. And what that model infers in the end, it tells you basically, it tells you, you give it a test data and you say, okay, for, for in this example, so let's say we give it a bunch of images and the images were labeled cat and dogs and then uh, we train the model. And then when we have a trained model, then we deployed it in production, if I may, and then we get the data from, let's say, a social network, user-generated data. And then the model labels, the, it predicts the label is cat with certain accuracy, a certain percent of probability. And that's the whole workflow, essentially, at very high level. Uh, any, if you have any question, just raise your hand. I, love answering questions and I don't want to leave you confused at any stage and we'll start to dive deeper into these so there are two basically like I was saying the trends or the domains I'm seeing the data science domain where people are more interested in inventing new models creating machine learning models and there's other set of people especially the enterprise which will be focused on building applications or taking these models and solving a business problem a use case for your company or for whatever you work. And that's, personally, I'm more interested in that side of thing. Um, but, you know, it's whatever you like to do. And if you are more, you think you're more for data science person, this is the product that is going to be uh, releasing to the public soon this summer, is what I've heard. It's our data science cloud where you can run notebooks and uh, do all kind of like uh, the whole data pipeline from big data engineering to training the model, deploying the model, monitoring them, all of that. So I'm not going to talk about this, uh, but you should keep an eye out on this uh, data science cloud. I'm going to jump into a demo now, and uh, we're going to see what I was talking about when I said classification. And uh, I like to show things in a visual way. So uh, I have a program here. It's, a, it's kind of a Java program, but it's a using a language called processing. Uh, and what it is doing, it's visualizing a classification use case. So I'm gonna run this processing sketch. And I have another software here. It's called Vaculator. It's a uh, machine learning software, basically. And what I'm gonna do is, I'm just gonna set it up uh, for classification. and. Uh, it will connect to this processing uh, application. So, okay, we'll just minimize this for now. So, focus, so here, this application, processing application, basically we have a, it's detecting the position, the X, Y coordinate of my mouse right now. And I'm just gonna click a few places, and this is, I'm gonna show you the whole pipeline from feeding the data, training it. So I'm providing it some data sets. And these data sets have, Basically, two uh, features, you can say, in machine learning terms, or two input, uh, uh, input feature. So there is X and the Y position for each of these. And uh, I can provide two kinds of images. So red ones, and I'll provide a bunch of these blue ones. So I'll provide them. And uh, now the job, the program that I want to write, or the machine learning model that I want to build, is something that will classify. That'll tell me this is the red one and this is the blue one. Right? Without writing rules about it, without telling it at this position, this, letting the machine learning figure it out. And uh, so this is the d data set that I've provided. So I'm going to train this. I'm going to start training this model. By the way, this is a, like a pre-trained model, but it, the same workflow applies if you're starting from scratch. Pre-trained means there's a model that is already, it does solve this problem, but I'm going to provide it more examples of, like I just, uh, added right now these examples and we're going to retrain it and reuse uh, this model. So I'm going to start the training and there are just a few examples so it trains pretty quickly. And now I'm going to run it here. It says testing. And uh, now I'm going to click anywhere in this canvas. As you can see the small blue dots. 
what is it is doing? It's predicting, it's making a prediction. If you are in this space, in this canvas, and clicking around, this is most likely the red ones, this is most likely the blue ones. And uh, how is it doing that? Uh, I'll show you visually. So we'll do a visualization. And as you can see, this is basically the underlying algorithm that is working, that is in effect right now. And it's called a k-means clustering algorithm, or KNN algorithm. And what it's doing, it's, it's finding a nearest neighbor. When I provided the test data, like when I click around, it's looking for the nearest neighbors. So in this case would be these red, basically, pictures. And it's predicting that high pro uh, pro probability that this is going to be red, so it marks it red. And this is like the boundary of it. So it's just a visual way to show it, show you. Um, I'm going to close this and we'll go on and I'll show you the next example. This is kind of like the hello world of machine learning. Simple classification, uh, linear classification in this, this example. We just had two classes, red and blue. But, you, but think of, let's say, let's, I'll give it a biology example. Let's say you're a scientist and you're looking at a cell or you're looking at a whatever here, yeah, human cell and you're, you're seeing uh, you know, are these cancer cells or are these healthy cells? And how would you know? So if you build a machine learning model and you provided these images, it'd be able to predict that these are the cancer ones and, and then you can attack the cancer cells. Just an example of what is possible with something like classification. Another use case or another example, very uh, simple use case rather, is a regression problem. And uh, we'll st start a regression sketch here and uh, let me do this stop the vaccinator yes so regression is a different kind of problem regression is basically a problem that works on a continuous set of data and it, it is in this case I'm, I have two variables again X and Y and uh, let me just quickly start vaccinator here so this vaccinator app it's based it's written it's a GUI software, it's written on top of uh, Weka, which is a Java-based open source machine learning toolkit. So, uh, uh, da -da -da. Yep. Uh, we have two inputs, one output, start listening, and uh, continuous, yep, okay. So, uh, here, I'm going to first provide it some data, some input, so in this case, what I'm doing is I'm clicking around and it's capturing the X and Y locations of these images. Now, the goal in the regression or simple linear regression is they call it find the best fitting line. So I'm gonna train this model first on this data set and I'm gonna switch to testing. And now what we're gonna do is I'm gonna provide it the input, as you can see, it's moving. This is only the x-axis. So I'm going to provide it value around the x, and it will predict what's going to be around the y. So, for example, if I click here, uh oh, sorry, something is wrong. Okay, messed up. The Start this again. Uh, there's one input value, yes, and uh, one output. And yeah, we'll start it again. And, uh, okay. I'll provide a bunch of, create a bunch of data set that we're going to train this regression algorithm, a regression model. And I'll start the training, and now I'm going to go in the testing phase, and I'm going to say, Okay, if I click here, it's, it's, you see the small, the green dots? Basically, it's, I'm only providing the X coordinate value and it's determining, it's figuring out what the Y value should be. Uh, and the, how it's doing it, it's, I'll again, I'll show you visually, it's creating this, basically this curve and it's matching that curve. So what it is essentially doing is, is looking at all the data set that I provided it and it's finding a best fitting, in this case, the, a curve 
and uh, all the, uh, the values, when I click around, these are plotted on this curve. And uh, it's, it's called the best fit curve. And it's ex essentially what it is. It's like a, if you were to buy a house, let's say, in Bangalore, and you, uh, you don't know the house price, but you want to predict what you want to like save money for next year. And uh, all you know is uh, the locality and uh, or maybe the how many bedroom the house is, but you don't have any price data. So when you only have one factor, one variable, how do you know what's the other one? That's what this model is doing. So if we only know this location, what is going to be the price and you know, we can go back in time or forward in time. That would be an application of regression. Um, all right, I'm going to quickly move and because uh, I'm see, keeping an eye on the time. And uh, I'll show you these examples in more detail in Deep Learning for J in a bit. But I want to cover some. So we saw the gap. So we saw that curve, right? And there was a gap between the green dots. And what that is, is kind of like an error. And in this case, so we had a dependent, we had one variable that I knew that I, uh, the x-axis, and it was figuring out what the y was, the independent variable. And the algorithm basically creates this line, and it's called a best fitting line. It, the line is supposed to best fit this data set so that there's minimum error. The, the data points are as close as possible to the line. That's what the goal is of uh, regression analysis. And it's also called model fitting or line fitting. So the re simple linear regression and simple classification are, you know, they, they can solve certain problems, but the more interesting problems, real life problems, are more complicated than that. And for those problems, we use something called artificial neural networks. And artificial neural networks, uh, we already, you already saw that deep learning model. And a uh, deep learning model is nothing but a, uh, a multiple layer, uh, in this case, uh, the first one on the left is a single layer artificial neural network. The one on the top right is a multiple layer neural network. Basically, these, the more you add these layers in the middle, they call them hidden layers. And the more you have, the deeper the network becomes. Because it's doing a lot of, lot of processing in those hidden layers, in those nodes, basically. And uh, they're Neural network is inspired by biology, how human brain and the neural network in our brain, in our nervous system performs. And uh, there are a few concepts that I, if you have any question, just ask me, because I'm going to go fast uh, looking at the time. So the first thing is something called activation function. So uh, activation function, what it, what it means is that it looks at the input variable. I'll actually, I have a slide for that, I'll, so I'll hold on to that. Activation function basically changes the model from a simple linear model to add non-linearity non to the model. It can solve more complicated problem, basically. And it also creates a threshold for your, the input that comes into this model. And the, these models are hi hierarchical, so they are learning in different stages uh, in these networks. And these networks come in different architectures, so different, like, uh, basically, Visually, we have represented them differently. So there is recurrent neural network, single neural network. There are all these convolutional neural network. There are different types of neural network. And all of these are the computation that happens is iterative. And that's why it takes a lot of cycles of training. And uh, you need a lot of data. And the goal is, again, to optimize or reduce the loss. Optimize for the errors. So as least error as possible in your prediction. And uh, then we also do something called model fitting, or we try not to uh, make the model so that it perf it's overfitting or underfitting. These are two problems that we try to avoid. Um, so the real world problems, you know, if we, if we were to do, uh, you know, if you just go out on the road right now and try to do image detection, you don't, we don't have label data for everything, right? Or if uh, you were to do, uh, uh, sentiment analysis on, you know, tweets. A lot of that is, a lot of da that data is not structured. It's unstructured data, we call it. And it's unlabeled. Nobody has labeled what these tweets, what this person mean, what kind of emotion. So we, 
We use something called unsupervised learning where we don't provide it. And a lot of those things need uh, deep neural network uh, strategies. So the real life problem basically need a non-linear approach in using uh, neural networks and different types of neural networks. So simple example, uh, so example, uh, this is a classic example in convolution neural network or image detection, which is best done by a convolutional neural network. This is a special type of neural network, which are good for doing image recognition. So in this example, what I'm showing is you would provide the model some kind of images. In this case, a person's image. And uh, it could be labeled or unlabeled. So an image could have a label saying a woman or a person, or it could be unlabeled, just images sourced from social network or wherever. Uh, is it predicting the data based on the algorithm? Then it's analyzing the existing data and it is giving the result analysis. Is the data analysis working? Yep, it's, but it's, uh, yes, it's doing data, it's doing data analysis. And exactly, and how it's doing, it's, it's, uh, it happens in these layers. So for example, in this case, and it's way more complicated, this is a simplified example. So in this case, let's say it's looking at, it's basically grabbing, looking at images. Computers don't understand this is a person, right? So it, it basically looking at these pixel values. And all of these pixels, and, and it's looking at patterns. So in this case, so there is a dominant color blue that is from her shirt, you know, there is a skin color, and, and then in the first layer, the neural network is kind of detecting the edges around this, whatever this may be, person, of course, we know it. And then in the second layer, it's finding more corners and contours of the shape and the body, and then finally it's detecting objects or parts. It could be like a face, glasses, hat, something like that. And finally, it basically gives you a prediction that you know, I'll just make this up, like 99% this is a person, or 2% this is an animal, or 10% this is a car, or something like that. And this is where, like, you'll see some memes on social media where people be like, you know, they'll show these images and they'll be like, see how stupid AI is and it's labeling this. Because these neural networks, they're not perfect, right? They give a probability. And uh, it's only as good as your data set or the algorithm that you've used to train it. So there are a lot of factors that go into these networks. Uh, so there is these layers. Uh, there are weights that we adjust in these layers. There is operation that happen. I talked about activation function. There are other optimization algorithms that happen. And these operations happen in the node in this graph. And uh, the goal is, of course, to predict. Uh, that's most often the goal in AI is give some kind of prediction. And uh, in, when you do prediction, you want to reduce the error or the loss function as we say. So this is, so there are many kinds of these activation functions. I won't go into the depth of it, but essentially what it does in this graph we saw, these graphs have different input features. So the person's image, like I said, you know, the colors, the pixel value would be different input feature sets. And uh, so all of this underlying, all of this is a lot of math, a lot of linear, linear algebra that happens. And in this example, so first what we do in this, in a typical activation function is we sum, we add the input weights, the weighted inputs, and then we add some, we, we uh, pass this summation through this function, it's called an activation function. And what it does is basically it, it uh, so for computers to perform operation, these mathematic calculations on a data set, they need to be in some kind of a, a fixed range, right? And generally, in a lot of these activation functions are generally go from like negative one to one. And we, we uh, you can think of normalizing the data set. Because uh, whatever data it is, we represent it as these numbers. So everything in the end becomes numbers and we do the artificial neural network does some kind of calculations on these. And there are different type of activation functions for different purposes. Uh, and, uh, and basically, uh, they occur at every uh, node in the graph. So what is all of this leading to is uh, basically the learning cycle or uh, the prediction is only as good as your loss function. And uh, there is a famous algorithm, it's called gradient descent, and this is a particular kind of gradient descent called stochastic gradient descent algorithm. It's basically, uh, it looks like this curve, and what it's saying, 
it's basically the goal is to converge, find this minima, find this bottom, this most point, in, and this is, this is like all the math that I'm explaining, but in using diagrams and pictures and graph to make it more easier to understand. Um, so uh, this, during this learning phase or this training phase, there is uh, this function needs to be optimized, the loss function. And it happens iteratively, and you do that by changing the weights that we saw on the graph, or we call the, the parameters or hyperparameters. And then, or we can use different learning algorithms, including different activation functions. And we can improve by also providing more data or better data sets, or rich data sets, or dividing the data set correctly between training data and test data. Because those, those need to be separate so that we can, uh, you know, we can authentically say that this machine learning algorithm is not just works on training data, but it also works on real life data. Uh, so, what does the machine learning cycle look like? So first step is defining the problem. So first you have to figure out what kind of problem are you solving. Is it a regression problem or classification problem? What kind of algorithm you might be using? And then you start to build your neural network. You collect data and you train it for an epoch or a cycle. And then you look at the error rate. And the error rate is supposed to go down. And if it is not going down, then you check the validation is it going down on validation? Because there is a, there's three different phases. There's training phase, there's testing phase, and there's validation phase. And uh, if it is not, then you may need to retrain it on more. If it performs well, then you're finished. And you can set a threshold, like, okay, if the error rate is like, or if the, uh, the prediction is like 99%, then I want the training to stop because uh, this cycle, you don't want to spend computation on this endlessly. So, and there's, there are other algorithms that happen in this phase. It's not just, you know, a forward pass in this case. It's also a backward propagation. So if there is an error, then uh, through on this graph, you can traverse backward in this graph, and you can optimize different sections of these different layers. Uh, and, and that's what the magic of this deep neural network is. Uh, the, these hidden layers, we call them, or some people even think of it like a black box. Uh, it basically optimizes parameters so that in the next cycle you get a better improved uh, prediction. And uh, so you're not doing these manually. You're not changing the code. You're changing, you're tweaking these hyperparameters. But the, the fun thing is that AIs or machine are learning and they are kind of writing the code in a way if you want to think like that. They are creating this model. So uh, that's why so, so many people are excited about this technology and it's creating really, it's giving great results right now. Um, so I'll go and I'll, let's walk through. So I'm going to walk through the code and uh, walk through a couple of examples and I'm going to use deep learning for J. So let's see if you can, uh, can you, can you read the code in the back? Is it readable or no? It's not. Is it kind of? I think the it's the projecting projector screen is pixelated. So uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna well, let's see. I think there is a way to make this. Uh, yes. How do you do that? I think somewhere here. There you go. Perfect. So uh, all right. What I'm what I have is it's a. Uh, this is a simple classifier, and uh, so a lot of these libraries and toolkits, so, you know, that's why I covered the theory that I covered in, you know, such a quick time, because when you start using these libraries, uh, you may come across these terms like activation function, cycles, epochs, all of these things, and may not make sense, so it's good to have this, some background knowledge before you jump into the code and start uh, writing or messing with these things, because then it starts to make sense and connect. At least that's how I, that's how I learn it. So, uh, so what we are doing is we're just initializing some data, some variables here. So this is a seed. So what this, what this is, it's kind of just a number. It's a random number. And we use this to create a random number generator in our, you'll see, down in the code. And we define a learning rate. A learning rate is something uh, that uh, you will, 
basically you change this variable depending on how the performance is happening. So in this case, we have a 0.01 learning rate. Learning rate. We have a batch size set to 50. N epochs is the number of cycles, and we're set to 30. And uh, input, are there two inputs, and there is one output, just like the example I showed you before the classifier. And uh, there are a number of hidden nodes. In this case, I'll define it as 10 nodes, 20 nodes, 20 hidden nodes. And you can change these, and that's where, you know, when you're writing these programs, you will be changing a lot of these variables. Uh, so first thing, we'll grab the data set, and then, uh, so basically it's a file, it's a CSV file, and uh, Deep Learning for J has a handy utility function, so class path resources deprecated, so there is something else now that where you can load CSV data or image data really easily uh, in, your, in your program, and you create something called a record reader object. And in this case, we need a special type of record because we are do dealing with CSV data. And uh, we'll initialize it, and we split that data set into uh, training data and test data. And then we need uh, something called a data set iterator, and this iterates over these, this, tr this record of training and test data. And uh, we pass all these variables that we defined above, batch size, uh, and in this case, the label, there's only one label. Uh, and same thing we create for, we create an object for uh, reading the test data set. This is the fun, this is the heart of it. Basically, we create the neural network by creating this configuration object. And multi-layer configuration is basically a multi-layer neural network. And there are different types of neural network. And uh, Deep Learning for J uses builder pattern where you, uh, where you pass these variables that we define into these, into these methods as part of this class. So there is the seed, which is, the, which is a pseudo-random number generator. Number we keep, we keep the same value, the 123 in this case, or you can put any number here. It basically helps to generate, a, creates a pseudo-random generator using this seed function. And uh, we, provide an uh, we provide weights uh, that are initialized and uh, so a lot of so you would have to read a lot of this because uh, there are conventions so uh, I'll just show you so there are conventions so in this case uh, they are predefined so there are a lot of these Xavier uniform relu these are predefined uh, basically weights that uh, we just we just call so we don't have to uh, oops uh, let me, we don't have to numerically define them. We can call these constants. So, uh, how do I go back to my, let me exit the presentation mode. Okay. Alrighty. Okay. Okay. So, uh, and then we have this thing called an updater function. And basically, this is where you pass your uh, gradient descent algorithm. This is the optimization algorithm. So when we are creating this neural network, we're defining this function. And this is a special type of uh, gradient descent algorithm. And it has uh, two uh, parameters. It has a learning rate and a momentum. And you learn about these uh, as you start to read the theory. Learning rate is what rate, and we define it above, it's 0.01. And momentum, this pretty standard value that is used in a lot of machine learning uh, programs is set to 0 0.9. And then uh, we create a list. A list basically will help us, in the, it will stack these layers. So we have in this case just two layers, an input and an output layer. And uh, now these layers in themselves need to define some kind of uh, activation function that we talked about earlier. And these are certain, certain types of activation function, uh, sigmoid function, and ReLU. And that's what we're using for the input layer. And for the output layer, we are using the sigmoid function. And then n in is the number of hidden nodes. And uh, n out is the number of uh, output nodes. So these, are, these were defined above in number of hidden nodes. And output nodes, in this case, was 20. And output is 1. And then finally, we call build. 
on the layer and then we call build on the on this configuration object and uh, then we have uh, then we initialize the model and we pass it this configuration object and uh, once you initialize the model we attach a listener to it so that we can uh, basically log because we want to we want to log the data when it's training how the model what the what those values are the score is basically and we start the cycle so we train it in this case, this is defined to 20, so we loop around 20 times, and the model.fit is where you fit or you train this model. Um, and then, uh, and uh, down here is, uh, so we're done with training, and then we evaluate the model. And uh, in evaluation stage, we use a different data set, which is our test data set, and uh, we iterate over the test data set, and uh, basically, we look at the features that were that are passed that are part of this data set. So, um, so this is an uh, this is basically like a tensor. It's an array and uh, ND is basically n-dimensional array. This is an interface class, so it's, it reads IND array object. And uh, we need to provide it when we are evaluating. We we, we want to provide it the features the labels against and we evaluate against the prediction so this the model object is uh, created here is initialized here and then we grab the output and then we compare basically we evaluate the labels against the prediction so what the train what the evaluation data set right so uh, so what the labels it has and what the label the model predicted should have and we compare those two and then we print the the score and there's down code here below to oops uh, let's run this program so we have to exit this so I'll create a little UI application actually let's close this so as you can see create a little Java FX application and it's showing you the same thing I showed you before so it's a classification it's classifying so we gave it a bunch of data set and it's classified there, was, there are two types of uh, classes here there's the blue one and the red one and uh, and you would see the result you can graphically see that all the red ones belong in this section and all the blue ones belong in the other section right there is no anomaly and then uh, in the logs uh, we'll do this it shows you basically the score so it shows you how accurate it was what the precision was what the recall and the F score F score is uh, is a weighted sum average of these variables so it 1.0 means 100% the model worked 100% correctly right now uh, it's a very small data set uh, and it's a pre-trained model so it worked pretty well and there is something called confusion matrix so a lot of this data set can be, uh, there can be false positive or false negatives in them. Uh, meaning that, uh, it's hard to uh, describe, meaning like let's say, uh, let's, let's do can cancer example. Because it's such a hard problem, we want to solve that. So let's say if you were to detect cells, cancer cell, non-cancer cells, you can have a false negative saying the machine learning in its training and evaluation it predicted that uh, this is not a cancer cell, but in reality it was a cancer cell. It's, it's a false and negative, or a false positive could be it is, and it's not, vice versa. And there is true negative and true positive. So uh, that's what this kind of matrix shows you. Um, let me let me walk through another example, uh, and let's. Exit this. Um, let's do this. Let's do something interesting. Let's do MNIST classifier. So this is a very common use case again in machine learning, in deep learning, especially image recognition. And in this case, uh, I'm using a uh, convolutional neural network, and this uh, this is an interactive application. So what I'm so there is a really uh, classic problem when you start to learn about deep learning is you grab a data set which is ha handwritten images, there are a bunch of them, uh, and they are images of digits, so 0 to 10, and you have to basically tell 
the algorithm, the AI machine learning needs to predict what it is. So, it's, so we'll run that right now. So for example, I can draw here right now. So if I just say, let's say two, and I'm gonna hit enter, and it predicted it's two. And this is happening in real time. So like I was saying, so once you have a trained model and then you can deploy and you can in your, in your application, and this could have been deployed in a mobile app or right now it's just a simple uh, Java FX app. So I'm going to uh, write something else. So I'll say seven and I'll hit enter and it predicted seven. And you're seeing uh, under this, this is a tensor and it's basically showing you it's uh, the, it's values, uh, so it's a uh, vector, it's a uh, array of arrays, and these won't make sense uh, right now because it's just showing you the raw values. But let me do this, let's, uh, I wanted to go wrong so you see that you know that this is actually working and it's a very hard problem. So it's four, this is a very well trained model. Uh, let's say, let's say if I write six, but I do it like that. It's hard, right? Like, let's say if you were to, you know, write a check, and in the check you wrote something like this, and somebody would be like a six, or is it G, or what is it? So, and if you were to deploy a machine learning in a bank, and to do this, uh, in this case, it d predicted it as one. So it'll, you know, it'll take the wrong amount of money out of the check, right? It could be six million here. <laughs> so, so, uh, so uh, it's predicting it one, and uh, so it's not perfect, because uh, it's, because you know it probably needs uh, more examples of this image labeled as six. So then next time you train it, the algorithm knows, okay, this is a six. And uh, that's one way to improve it. You can p pick a better algorithm that it was used to train this thing. So uh, let's do one more. So let's do, uh, give me hard, let's do uh, eight, but we'll do this. Cause, and uh, let's see what it says. So it says eight, so it's kind of pretty good uh, right now. Um, but you know, hard to say, like this is eight, or what, what is somebody drawing here? So, uh, so uh, example, and this is more complicated. Uh, well, actually, let's walk, I'll walk through this one. And this is a, uh, so these images, this MNIST data set, these are images, they are basically 28 by 28 pixel in size. So that's the, so I like, like I was saying, the machine, the computers don't know what these images mean, right? So we provided this pixel, like dimension of this, uh, this image. So it's a 28 by 28 pixel image. And we, uh, that's how, that's the size of our tensors, 28 by 28. And then we uh, provided output number of output classes. So in this case, it could be from zero to 10, these digits. And it tells us, give us prediction. It's 98%, it's eight or something like that, right? So we provided a batch size is how many size we want to train at a time. And uh, this is again a pseudo random number generator seed we provide uh, and number of cycles we want to train it. And again, we separate our data set into training and test data set. And, uh, and then we build a model in this case, uh, in this case, actually, this is not using a convolutional neural network. This is a, you can, you, we can use, uh, so this dense layer, this would be, a, oops, I clicked uh, the definition. Let me go back. Uh, so, do, do, do. So, okay, I have very little time left. So we define the layers. Uh, and we define something called regularization here. And again, this is our stochastic, it's our uh, actually different kind of a gradient descent algorithm called Nestrovus or some gradient descent that has momentum in it. And uh, this is our learning grid in this case was 0 0.006, momentum is 0.9. And this is our input, input number of input features. So those are times of number of rows times column. So 28 by 28 and uh, output, uh, output nodes are 1000. And when you create the second layer, the output needs to match the, the input needs to match the same as the output of the previous one. Um, in this case, uh, and then we define our activation function uh, and they define the weights. And basically you train the model, uh, you set the listener and uh, so that we can uh, log the data every time it trains and then uh, we evaluate the model here. And uh, yep, and then uh, 
basically we just print the logs. Uh, so that's, you know, the code, I'm sure now you can understand it's readable, things start to make sense. Maybe you don't understand everything what it means. Uh, I just wanted to clear the myth away from deep learning, machine learning. Hopefully you got some better idea. I uh, want to switch to slides quickly so we can conclude this talk. And uh, I recommend you, so there are a couple of mindset or just best practices I've learned. So uh, it's a different way of programming as you're seeing. It's not like if I'm detecting images, I'm not writing a program that manually look at every pixel and check to see if this is a line. Like in the old days of computer vision, we were doing edge detection, a lot of these things, and manually did figuring it out what this image is. But now using deep neural network, we provided data and we let the algorithm figure it out. So the so Peter Norvik, he's a famous AI scientist from Google, he talks about this thinking like a natural scientist versus more imperative way of coding, more like writing the if-then statements, uh, but letting the machine do it. So the approach he calls is the observation, experiment, and test cycle. And, uh, and I also see programming machine learning is more kind of like close to functional programming than more classic, imperative, very logical way of writing code. Because data, we're dealing with data, and data is where the operations are happening. So it's more functional, and, uh, and garbage in, garbage out. So the quality of data is very important. And uh, last thing is machine learning is not like, you know, the tool for every job. It's like a hammer. It's only good for putting nails inside the wall. So uh, people think, let's just throw machine learning at everything. It's not the best tool. It's very expensive. Uh, and you need to first, critical first step is define the problem and uh, architect the right frame, uh, the framework for it. So there are other things that also we should pay attention to. There is, you know, data quality. Uh, there is algorithms that you need to pay attention to. There are ethical issues like biases, privacy. Uh, when, when we are dealing with machine learning, and especially we need a lot of data to train that. And there are more existential issues facing society that as machine learning practitioners, you should think about these things as well. And uh, I'd like to show you some learning resources. So there is uh, this GitHub repo you've, you can check out where I've, uh, oops, internet is not working. Wow, okay. So basically here was a bunch of, uh, I don't know if it'll work, but uh, okay, maybe it will. There are a bunch of links to a lot of machine learning. If you want to do in Java, there are a lot of documentation, a lot of code, a lot of uh, blogs and stuff out there, and I recommend you check that out. Uh, go back to my slide. Uh, there is a TensorFlow. I couldn't get to that, but essentially, this is Google has supported it, uh, not officially, but and it's not. It's basically it's it's good for inferring the model. So it's not uh, available, TensorFlow for Java developers is not available to train the models, but you have the model, and then you can use them to deploy in an app, uh, a Java application. So they kind of show how you create a project, uh, the Maven file and the, the Palm file, and then basically this is the code where uh, they're showing how you're using one of the pre-trained model uh, to do a machine learning prediction. And uh, so yeah, I recommend you follow this uh, tutorial. It's very simple. All you need is you need to have this TensorFlow jar file, of course, the pre-trained model, and uh, this is how you would do it. There's a simple Hello World example. And uh, go to my keynote. And there is a Deep Learning for J tutorial. That's a really good one. I think that's number one library right now for Java developers. There are some books you should check out, uh, online meetup. Follow me on Twitter, Java handle. We will share more stuff there. I'll be writing some blog posts, some YouTube tutorials on doing a lot of these projects uh, uh, using a lot of these open source libraries. And then, of course, post questions on Stack Overflow as well. Because, uh, you know, the more stuff we have as Java developers, people Google, somebody will answer, it starts to develop this community. So not everybody has to, like, you know, jump ship and learn something totally new and forget all your background knowledge. So, uh, so yes, yeah, share your expertise. And uh, funny thing, 
This is like a, one of the activation function called sigmoid function. It also represents how learning happens. So when you start to learn, things may look easy. And then quickly you'll see after getting started with simple examples, learning curve becomes steep. But keep persisting. Uh, you'll get there at the top and then it'll be easy again. So this is a typical learning curve. I'm sure you, you know this from your experience. And uh, any questions this time? Any burning, any question, anything I covered? Or I, yeah, please. Deep learning for J uses its own uh, mathematical library called ND4J. It's, I don't know what it means, but it's, I think it's, it's like a TensorFlow library. And TensorFlow is basically, it's a, it's, again, it's a mathematical library. Uh, it does a lot of these math operations on these graphs. And uh, uh, what they recommend is something called Keras, which is a more high level abstraction library where it's easier to create these models, train them, versus dealing with very low level tensors. Tensors are like array of arrays. So Deep Learning for J has their own library. Uh, it's written in Java and I think Scala, and it's called uh, ND4J, and they use that. But they support models that are trained in Keras or TensorFlow that you can bring them and uh, you can run them in Deep Learning for J environment. Um, say that again? Yes, this is uh, curious. So they, all of these, they create a model in the end. It's a file, it's a binary file. And you can use these models in Deep Learning for J. And you can, do, and you can use these models to do inference. So not for tra training, but in for inferring it, yeah. So thank you very much, guys. And I just wanted to say, uh, yeah, thanks again for sticking around. And uh, I'm, I'll be here if you have any questions. And cheers to you and your learning for AI and machine learning. So thank you very much. <laughs> All right. Take care.